This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. It's been a very lively season on Broadway, and we're going to discuss it tonight with three of New York's top drama critics. Here to introduce them, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. If you're a Broadway producer, I think this is going to be a rough show for you, because <laughs> these are some of the toughest people you come up against in this business. But we love them. They're always lively. And I'm very happy to have with us the critics tonight, Linda Weiner, the chief critic for Newsday, also host of Women in Theater, which airs on our, uh, our sister station, CUNY Television. Linda, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. You're holding up my DVD. I'm holding up your DVD. I have a, we'll, I have we'll, a product. <laughs> right. <laughs> Charles Isherwood, the host of Men in Theater, but he didn't bring his DVD with him, <laughs> who is the drama critic for the New York Times. Welcome, Charles, to Theater Talk. Thank you. And my good friend and colleague at the New York Post, Clive Barnes. Welcome. All right, Clive, I'm going to put you on the spot because um, I happen to think that one of the most extraordinary plays I've seen in a long time is Alan Bennett's History Boys. Almost uh, unanimous rave reviews with one holdout. Yes, indeed. Clive Barnes of the New York Post, who I think gave it one star. I think I did, yes. Now, but why are you going against the grain on this well, wonderful I, play? Well, I was generous with one star. No, uh, <laughs> uh, why am I going against the grain? Well, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm in a minority. That doesn't make me wrong, nor does it make me right. But uh, I perhaps... Uh, I had much the same experience as Alan Bennett. We both went through the uh, English kind of uh, pushy kind of grammar school where they do try to cram you, it did at that time, try mm -hmm. to cram these working class kids into Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, and and um, this is the setting of the play. This of the is play. the setting of the, the play. The school with yes. boys school, that they want to. The school with the boys. Well, I just felt it was so totally unrealistic. I felt it was the it 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 had a snob appeal, but it didn't have any real appeal. Uh, I thought that it was um, quite extraordinarily and uh, anti. Uh, male heterosexual. Uh, I think that if I mean the only the, the only male heterosexual as far as I could see, uh, unambiguous, uh, was the very unsympathetic headmaster, and I felt that it was phony, and that uh, it it seemed to um, try to appeal to uh, a kind of. Anglophilia, um, an English Anglophilia as well. I just want to ask. Yeah. I want to ask you guys, though. I mean, were you put off by the um, the uh, hetero bashing in this play? <laughs> and does Clive have a point, though, that it does kind of appeal to the New York crowd that just loves everything the BBC runs on Channel Thirteen? I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, the fact is that it's literate. Mm -hmm. There are like complete sentences here. There are interesting mm -hmm. characters. It's a subject that we don't know very much about here, and and. When I saw it first in London, I thought, boy, this is really terrific theater. I can't imagine that they can do it in America because it's so very English. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad they brought the original cast yeah, yeah. with. But I think it has you know, much bigger issues than just how you're going to get into um, you know, flashy, how you're going to pass the flashy test. This issue of, of oh, high art and low art, uh, isn't, isn't that... Rather corny. Well, I yep. think the, the issue of the purpose of education is a pretty vital one now, especially what's going on with No Child Left Behind. And testing. Which is all about, you it's know, about you testing. have to do well on the test scores and the teachers have to, you know, completely reassess their curriculum and the way they, you know, operate. And it sort of takes the humanity out of the process. I and mean, that's sort of what I think, yes, that, that I find that a moving and Yeah, it's the sympathetic, thing. the sympathetic master. Uh, and he was, you know, this great kind of fat, lovable slob, wonderfully played by Richard Griffiths, by the way. His idea of education was teaching kids to learn by rote large passages of uh, verse, which to me doesn't seem and very movies. educational. And movies. Now, yes. is it what Grief encounter. <laughs> do, do, you, do you agree with one critic who called it a subtle form of gay propaganda? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I do agree with you that the one character who rubbed me the wrong way in terms of the way it was yeah, written yeah. was the, the headmaster. Yeah. It was, he's the only character the yeah. way it was caricatured. Yeah. And that sort of bothered me. But no, I don't think it's gay propaganda. 
What about uh, the pedophilia thing? Um, this yeah, is, we should say that the the, the, the yeah. lovable the lovable guy yes, Richard Griffiths yes. is a is a pedophile. Although well, Richard Griffiths has said many times that he's not a he's pedophile. Not a pedophile. He pedophile. only goes after the boys who are above nineteen. He, he just oh, gropes no, them. No, no. No, <laughs> above eighteen, and he above just 18, gropes yeah. them. He doesn't. It's not like he's wanting to have sex with children, which is his definition. Don't you find that a bit contrived? Well, Linda? if you um, if you look at the script, they are not 18. They are right. all 16 and 17. Exactly. So they change that, that you know, their their rap on it, their riff for it. For the Broadway for, audience? Well, because this country is so hysterical about, you know, anybody having sex with anybody under 18 right now. So it's such a hot button issue that they had to start lying about what the play's really about because we are like a tiny bit foolish. I think this idea is the real thing. What are you saying? No, 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 but there's nuance. Yes, that it, and no one was damaged. This wasn't one of those American, you know, dysfunctional children ruined by their teacher. Mm -hmm. They were all cool about it. Everybody was a lot more grown up. Well, that's why you would call it gay propaganda, because everybody was cool well, about let's it. Ask Clive. Well, well, let's ask Clive. You were in these schools, Clive. Yeah, if the teachers you. were feeling you up, was it, hey, uh, no well, big deal? You no, know, no, I don't think there was any actual groping going, going on. And I think that they were all fairly... Um, Fairly reserved, I, I think. But they, but there was, um, I think, in the English public school system, which is or grammar school system. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I think uh, there are quite a lot of uh, of gay masters. At least there were at that time. I think it's because uh, you have to offer very high powered intellects the uh, some reason to teach at very low salaries. This isn't an issue about gay versus straight, this, uh, but the issue is, it, you know, to, to sort of soft pedal that a teacher would mo would molest right. the students and then say, well, they're 18, so it's okay. That's something that I, I do find is a, is a slight issue, that they do make it very so benign. It made as though it's part of the lovability of this guy, and also it's al almost made part of their educational process. Yeah. I mean, uh, Charles, well, you were going to. Is this pedophilia talk? And you say, you know, I th think it makes it's part of his humanity that, you know, he's a fully complex character who is deeply flawed in this way, but also has. You know, the other guy was deeply flawed as well, as we discover. When, he, when we you know, discover that he's not quite so bad as we thought he was, we also discover that he's gay, the other teacher. Mm -hmm. But still, we all we'll move on. All right, speaking of deeply flawed, um, Julia, Robert, <laughs> Julia Roberts' performance in Three Days of Rain. Um, uh, Linda, um, yes. can this um, acclaimed movie actress perform on stage? I thought... Here it is. My husband calls this the Cheese Stands Alone review. <laughs> I, he, sings, he sings in the morning and dances around me. The, um, I thought it was an entirely honorable performance. I thought there was no disgrace in it all. I think the jumping up and down on her was so absolutely out of proportion to the size of the crime. She did not come on doing Hello, Dolly. She did not say, I'm going to do Shakespeare. She chose an ensemble piece where she could do something intelligent, bring people in to see an intelligent play. I thought there was beyond no shame. Mm -hmm. I thought that she had some reason to be proud of her choices. But I'm not hearing good from you, Linda. I think was, well, I think it was an intelligent, honorable, lean, smallish performance in, in an ensemble piece. All right, but do you guys want to do some jumping on her, though? Well, uh, I could quote the first lines of your review, which were rather <laughs> yeah. memorable. Hated yeah. the play, hated her too. Was there <laughs> Is that your feeling of this, uh, uh, this no, performance? No. Um, I thought she, she, clearly she doesn't have stage technique. Um, and she seemed ill at ease to me. But that most character was in ill at, first, an ill at ease character. Yes, but there's one thing to. You know, I think I can distinguish, well, we're obviously different, I, but I, somebody <laughs> acting ill at ease or actually being ill at ease. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but that said, you know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, a director maybe not being able to capture the natural warmth of her personality 
you know, in this new medium. I mean, clearly they just couldn't get to it because you, you know, you see your own film. And that director would be Joe Mantello, yeah, who Joe stumbled Mantello. this season. I think the, the interesting thing is that it almost was an object lesson in the difference between movie acting and stage acting. They didn't capture what is this remarkable, I mean, it, she's not just a film star, she's a wonderful film actress. And they didn't even catch, to my mind, that marvellous radiance. I mean, I I went expecting to be enchanted. I I, I love the woman. I mean, you know, uh, I don't keep I don't keep p pictures of her over my bed, as apparently your your colleague does. But <laughs> and Bradley, who calls himself a Julia Hollick. <laughs> he, he, she inhabits his dreams, but no, she doesn't inhabit my dreams. No, but uh, I, Richard I, Griffiths I, does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, uh, but I did feel that that um, she she's a marvelous marvelous screen actress, and somehow none of that emerged. Now, whether that was yeah, she's no, or she's no Melanie Amanda. Griffith. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually well, liked Melanie Griffith. In Chicago, I, yeah. I thought her personality came through in that role. In well, a way if you want to just Roberts have didn't. a personality, it seemed to me that what Julia Roberts did not want to do is go and do her pretty pretty woman smile and but can't and she do anything else? Well, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> on me, film, she she's a lovely radiant presence. Can but Melanie she's doing Griffith variations. sing or dance in a dancing, singing musical? Is oh, it okay? Now you're nitpicking. <laughs> <laughs> but Melanie Griffith is not the gold standard. No, no. <laughs> well, one of them got wonderful reviews oh, and no, an invitation didn't. to come back anytime, dear. And another one has basically, you know, had cleats on her face and I, being drummed out of town. I don't think that's true. I think, I think the reviews for Julia Roberts, possibly with his being an exception, <laughs> were very sympathetic. People really went out poor of their dear, way. To say, poor dear. To say that, um, you know, this is yeah. perhaps the right, wrong choice for her. These are character roles, and she is a, a personality actress, and maybe, well, anyway. But let, let me ask you a question that I hear from uh, the people in the, the, the theater world, from producers and agents, who are, were very, very upset with the treatment of Julia Roberts, because they feel that... The theater is having uh, enough trouble uh, attracting attention to itself without stars. Um, creative, argents, uh, creative Artists Agency has a lot of stars like Julia Roberts and Tom Hanks that they want to bring to Broadway. When they read these blistering attacks on Julia Roberts, their big stars, they feel, are going to pull back and not come to Broadway, and that you, you critics, have made it inhospitable it's all to our stars. Fault. It's all your fault. It's all our how fault. Do you respond, how do you respond to that? Well, perhaps, I mean, lessons. They could take lessons. They could. <laughs> <laughs> but you said you didn't No, I don't lessons. think so. Oh. Not about her. How to the general. But right. in general, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, we've had, I mean, Michelle Pfeiffer got practically killed. They wild. They went wilding on her. Twelfth night years in ago. Twelfth yeah. night. Ashley Judd could have used a little lesson or two. <laughs> for Cat in the Hatton Room. Ashley Judd. Um, <laughs> Jessica Lange started out really horribly in, um, in, in Street Street Street. Oh, well. In, not Streetcar, in the first one. She was Glass first Menagerie. in uh, Glass Menagerie. No, first she was in Streetcar. Street yeah. Then she played Glass Menagerie as if she were in Streetcar. Mm -hmm. So, um, but she, you know, she keeps trying. I don't think there's any disgrace in people trying to do other things. Mm -hmm. um, and. But but are you tougher on the movie star because you know if your you know your readers and your editors are going to cackle over you really sort of sticking it to a big movie star who falls? Uh, no. Uh, first of all, I think Jessica Lange is a great stage actress. I, I saw her do Streetcar in London and she improved yeah. immensely. And I saw her marry Tyrone in London. And it was one of the best. Yeah. Things That's I've ever what seen I hear. She do only London. does it well in London. <laughs> so the fact is that there. Yeah. <laughs> the fact is there are you know movie actors who manage to you know make their technique work on stage. But I, you know, but it I think took her 12 years. It's ridiculous for them to say that we should be cheerleading every time a star comes to Broadway. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just... <laughs> but just know, as ridiculous for... Critics have no integrity if they do that. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think that, that people pick on movies. No, I don't think that at all. I think that people honestly do, uh, critics, uh, do... Uh, <laughs> because critics are people. Um, they, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not true. Not true. <laughs> there and are occasionally people. they're a woman. <laughs> but in fact, I, I honestly believe 
that uh, all of us um, are pretty even-handed, whatever the background. And also remember... Hated, hated that the play, hated her. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, there that are one, occasions when there you can't be occasions. even-handed. <laughs> there are occasions where one, where one expresses oneself more strongly than usual. But, um, and I did think the, she was enormously overhyped. And I do feel that it is not a good idea to, for Broadway, in effort to sell seats, to offer an open house to any movie star who wants to come in, whether they can act on the stage or not, or whether they have experience of the stage or not. I think it's insulting to, uh, to stage to stage, serious stage actors, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not that I think there should be any difference, but I think there's a very big difference between stage acting and movie acting, and indeed I do think that, that, that Ms. Roberts gave a, a, an object lesson in the difference. Well, that difference, though, uh, the, 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 the best side of that difference, I think, you can see in um, Rafe Fiennes in The Faith yes. Healer. Or now, Alan Bates, for example, was a right. wonderful example of a man who, who completely changed his acting approach from mm -hmm. stage to screen. Now, they were also, they were trained stage actors. They're yes. English. The, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the, the, no, it's just... Our actors are geographically impaired. We force okay. them to choose between movies yeah, and living in L.A. Mm -hmm. or theater yeah. and movie and living here. And it's very, it's not like London where everything yeah. is in the same place and someone can go and do a play and then that night do a radio show and radio play and then do a movie and then, so you have much more well-rounded actors. That was true, very true. 30 years ago, slightly true 20 years ago. I don't think it's so true now. You know, a, a lot of Ralph, Ralph Fiennes, however you pronounce his name, I never know. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but that one. That uh, he, he, he mixes uh, stage with screen, and mm -hmm. yeah. he could very well be living in Hollywood. Perhaps he does. Now, I want to ask know. you about the Faith Healer, though, because it got very, very good reviews, although you dissent Some a mix. bit. No I, mm. no, I really loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it, but I did. I could really see how it could. Some people would really be annoyed by it, and I, and I put that in the review, which I don't often do, just because people have sort of had to be warned, warned that it is, you know, it it just nowhere monologue. <laughs> and it is. It's it's a collection of four monologues. Four monologues about. and about somebody that you really may not care that much about. Mm -hmm. A. Um, a, a possibly faith healer, possibly and actor, possibly charlatan, charlatan, possibly you know kissed by God, who right, knows? Right. And and you know a s small potatoes one, you know. So that yeah. we are out on the road with them. But is this Charles now one of these things, one of these types of plays that uh, critics love? They just love all the, they love the writerly quality of the play. They love all that acting, and audiences, I get the sense, are completely bored at. I know a lot of audiences are finding it tough. I'm hearing there's a lot of walkouts at intermission. Um, and that's it, your guys' fault, because you send these people to see these plays that you overhype. What mine say well, that Ralph Fiennes, so the let, actor. Let, uh, well, well, but, but you like it, though. I think it's a wonderful play. And if, you know, I'm sure you both did your job. If people read reviews carefully, this is what I find somewhat uh, unnerving. If people read reviews carefully and don't just look for the stars, um, they'll know what they're getting into, and we'll be able to judge from that whether it's something that appeals to them. I mean, I know people who have said, I can't take the monologues, I'm not going. It's the people who uh, just sort of, oh, it's a hot show to see, there's a star in it, and the critics all loved it. Well, well if, they, if see, they go and they're disappointed, it serves them right. They see the giant picture, the headline, Ben's, you know, lead thing, which is so wonderful, and then they don't realize that with the nuance that they're seeing a play that's kind of leads nowhere at all. Did you guys Jerry both like Jerry Jones? Huh? Did you both like Jerry Jones? I love Jerry Jones. I, I thought, you know, here she is not playing a spinster mm -hmm. or a virgin. I she's she's playing a womanly woman I who, um, yeah. And you know how she always, she's so radiant that I get tired yeah, of yeah, thinking yeah. about her radiant. Right. But you can actually, she, she let you see the sort of the rot under the skin. Yeah. She, I would, I would look at her skin and think, how did she do that? A moment ago she was glowing, and now she actually, you could see her dying underneath. But I the was worm in the apple cheek. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but because, because well, you know, I, I wish I were a writer. <laughs> because she wasn't doing right. an accent. Many people sold short, whereas McDermott was doing Even this bravado accent yeah. chick, and the people were brilliant. I want to pick up on something that Charles, though, said about 
the way people are reading reviews today and, and um, you know, not paying that close attention to criticism. I wonder, do you guys still feel that criticism has the influence, the power, that um, readers of newspapers are paying as close attention to criticism as, as a form of an essay that maybe they once did, Clive, or now has it really just become, is it good, is it not good, is it worth my time, thumbs is it worth up, my thumbs effort, down. thumbs up, thumbs Four down. stars. I don't think that criticism has the influence it used to have. Uh, now, whether that's a good or bad thing, it's possibly a good thing, but I think that um, it, it, it simply doesn't, because I think that perhaps uh, print as a medium, and we've, we're, we're talking perhaps wrongly about print critics all the time now mm -hmm. here, and uh, perhaps print itself does not have the influence it used to have. I'm very surprised that television critics uh, have almost faded mm -hmm. completely from, from view, and the blog critics, as it were, mm -hmm. Uh, they, none of the blog critics, as far as I can see, has established, established himself or herself as a... A new Charles Isherwood. Well, yes, yeah. exactly. No one uh, has established themselves in the way that a critic can good establish time, himself. Yeah. Charles is a very good example, actually, of someone who has established himself within a very short time as a critical voice that he'd read. But I don't think that Charles is as carefully read, or Ben, or Linda, or anyone is as carefully read. Do you guys feel this way too? Yeah, and I actually, as long as we stay employed and as long as they continue to give us space and pretend we're important, I don't mind. I don't think right. it's. I don't really think it's an unhealthy thing that people no. are going other places and making up their own minds on yeah. things. But you get the sense, though, Charles, that people read criticism the way they once did. I mean, I, I grew up reading, you know, the Frank Rich, reading you, reading, well, reading you a bit. I mean, you're not quite. I am. <laughs> as yeah. filthy, but you actually. I, 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 mean, I just I, I read the review <laughs> just for the joy of reading your review. If I was a question, of, am I going to see the show or not going to see the show? You're all great writers, a pleasure to read. Do you get the sense that the readership is still there for that, Charles? Actually, I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I think one problem is that uh, you know Broadway and movies have sort of been able to market themselves around critics now. They you know they brand shows, they bring in the movie stars. Uh, you know, movie movie critics have far less influence than they used to too. Yeah. Um, so, and actually, I don't think, I mean, I think it is a bad thing because I, I think critics do serve an important function in, uh, you know, sort of leveling, mediating between the people who create the junk and the people who <laughs> consume it and maybe, you know, sort of trying to keep, trying to keep uh, standards up to a certain level, but if people aren't, if they are perceived as not having an influence, there's not going to be any, um, yeah. I still think that The Times has great influence. Uh, whoever's writing for the Times, uh, you know, uh, I've always said it, you know, uh, when I was actually on the Times, in Times Talk, um, in-house magazine, which probably died now, but uh, I, I once said uh, a Barbary Oak would have the same influence <laughs> as the New York Times drama critic, and as Barbary Oaks, we ought, we ought to be careful. They were very <laughs> offended by that. But, um, in fact, um, I do think the Times still on certain on a, on a major play i mean if if ben for example had damned the history boys mm -hmm. it would not have done the history boys if your review had run all. in the new york times for the history yes. boys that would have but been but ben yeah. loved well Indeed. and well close but that i think is, is rather a, a rarity it's not because <laughs> the, there again the subject matter of well never seemed attractive and um Ben was unable, or anyone was unable, to make it sound like the kind of thing, oh my God, I really want to go and see that. I, oh, well, I but know. now, Clive, we're going back to thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs down oh, kind are. of reviewing. Yes. So. Anyway, we've got to wrap it up. I'm sorry, it was an interesting and lively discussion. I want to thank Linda Weiner from Newsday and Women in Theatre <laughs> on oh, good. Okay. television. <laughs> Although we're not promoting it, because God knows we're non-commercial. <laughs> right. okay. Charles Isherwood, a fresh, great new critical voice at the New York Times, and uh, Clive Barnes, a, a wonderful uh, standard, 
uh, that you set the standard for criticism in this town, Clive, by okay. dumping on the History Boys and Julia <laughs> Roberts of the New York Post. Thanks for being our guests tonight. Well, so we close now with Linda Weiner, Charles Isherwood, Michael Riedels, and my favorite musical, but not Clive's, The Drowsy Shepherd. Clive was a little stat man, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Wait until it's ready. Surprise. Wait until it's ready. Surprise. Wait until it's ready. Now it's looking ready. Surprise.